go on God's side. Amen? And so we decided that we're going to do it. So we, we, we said goodbye to our, our church. It was really hard because these are, Bedford, those are our babies. Right? I still remember our very first opening service. We, we had one person who worked for the gap. He still works for the gap. He's, we, we out there sometimes he sends us certificates, you know. He got saved. He was our first convert, and he's still saved today. His girlfriend got saved, like, what was that, six weeks later, right? Maybe six weeks later. And, and now they got married. And the girls are, are you know, they, 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 there's history there. These are our babies. And God said, give them up. And then, and then our, 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 our bank account, we're our babies too. You know, make all the money and all that. And now we, we, we kind of give all that up too. You know, come here and, and certainly the church, you know, we're not, we're not, we're not born yesterday. We know church can't be like the secular world. We got to give that up too. It's a testing tough moment. It's a testing moment. What are you going to do about it? And then to give the friends. I mean, Pastor Greg Winslow, my best friend in the ministry. Best friend, period. You used to see him every week. And now, it's like once a year at best. In fact, for the first few years, you didn't even see him at all. You know, I had to give up all that. What is it that God is asking you to give up? What's, what's your testing moment? What is he saying? Because it's one thing to say that, yeah, I can pass a test when the test is easy. But what happens when the test is not so easy? You see, when you have to give up something that is so important. That's what happened to Abraham. But yet, yet, Abraham was relentless in his faith. He did it anyways. He, he, he packed up his bags, took Isaac, his son, and went, went to Moriah, the mountain, and he placed him on the altar, and he took a knife. And he was about to sacrifice his son, because that, that was the marching orders. And when he lifted up his hand, that's when God knew, passed the test. You proved yourself. See? And then, came another sacrifice, a ram was in the, the bush, and then as a result of that, boy, his, his faith retested, and it, 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 it solidified. It became rock solid after that. See, and, and, and sometimes we have to go through that. See, it, it, what if Abraham had failed? What if he did not obey God? What if he obeyed partially? What if he just took the son there and said, okay, okay, I see, I kind of did it and, and went back home again. See, partial obedience is still disobedience. It was relentless. Finishing is better than starting. Turn to your neighbor and say that. It doesn't matter that Abraham was so faithful up to this point. It doesn't matter that here is Abraham. You know, he, he didn't always live in a promised land. You know, he, he lived over where the Mesopotamia is. Uh, and, and then God one day told him, hey, pack your bags and go to this place. Well, where's this place? I'll tell you when you get there. I'm going somewhere where I don't even know where, it's go, where I'm going. I will lead you. Okay? Like he had demonstrated his faith. He had a good beginning, a good start. But what if he finished poorly? What if he finished in disobedience? See, likewise, it, it would not matter if you were an on-fire youth for Christ if you are younger or the youth. It wouldn't matter if you were an on-fire middler or toddler in view. Not if you finish poorly. Not if you finish having no faith in God. In fact, not even having faith in God. See, it's how you finish. Jesus himself was tested. In Matthew 26, 39, the New Living Translation says, he went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Jesus was in the garden. It was right before the, the trial and the crucifixion. And Jesus himself was tested. See, it would not have mattered at this point if Jesus decided, you know, I'm not going to forget it. It's so unfair. I have lived the holy life. I've not sinned. I've done anything wrong. And now I have to die for people and suffer and get whipped and, 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 and get crucified. Forget it. I'm not going to do it. See, if he didn't finish in the middle of God's will, in the center of God's will, it would not have mattered that Jesus started strong by performing all sorts of miracles and teaching credible messages. If he didn't finish his mission, it would not have mattered. Finishing is better than starting. Say that to your neighbor again. I believe in 2016, God will test you to see if you are at your work. I believe that. But be relentless. Be relentless. See, on a corporate level, this is the year that we're going to plant our first extension church in Hawaii. I announced that back at Mission Conference time. See, is it good enough that we plant the churches in China and India in partnership and East Timor, we sent the team, and Brazil, Pastor and and her team. Is that good enough? But finishing is better than starting. See, can God prove to heaven that Calvary 
can not only plant churches on the other side of the world, but also on the other side of the island. Right, Pastor Israel? Amen. Pastor Israel just got added onto the pastoral staff. He was just recently installed. And I'll tell you, this guy is going to be relentless in God's testing. He's already, I mean, he, he started on January 1st. That, that's his first day of, uh, that he was on the payroll. And, and in one week, he's already gone to North Shore twice. He's already gone with the team, already scooping up, praying. And, and just like when he was in Brazil for three years, he, he knows how to do it. And he's been trained in Singapore. And he's going to be relentless. Yeah, would there be obstacles? Absolutely. Would there be other denominations? Would there be cults who will who will oppose what we are doing? Absolutely. But see, again, are we going to be relentless about it? This guy's relentless. I, I, I know he is. And whoever is with him on his team, and, 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 and that's what God has called us to be. Relentless, not to quit, not to stop all because things are happening. We're also to be relentless in Satan's tempting. Be relentless in Satan's tempting. In Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13, we'll read this quickly. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written. Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left them until an opportune time. Okay, now this is a different situation now. Okay, Jesus said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. This is another test word now. This is the, this word test means temptation from the enemy. It is meant to bring you down. It is meant to make you choose the wrong thing. When God tests you, he's to prove you to do the right thing. That's the difference here. Okay? But whether it's God testing you, proving you to choose the right thing, or for the devil to tempt you to do the wrong thing, what do we do about it? It says here at the beginning, when we were reading, it says that, Jesus was tempted for 40 days. I don't know if you caught that. It says Jesus was tempted for 40 days. Some of us, we think we have a rough. The temptation comes, and it's just for like a few minutes. You know, I just, in my latest doctorate course I was taking, the professor was sharing some statistics. Okay, this is like after much research and all that. And I think this will be good. For especially the men in our church, but you know, it applies to women as well, too. You know, when the average man gets tempted to lust, okay, tempted to last to lust, it only lasts 20 minutes. It only lasts 20 minutes. Now, you one last for two hours, three hours, but that's because you're entertaining, okay, that's because you're entertaining, but. If that stats is true, which I believe it is, that means the devil is tempting you for 20 minutes. If you hold on to Jesus for 20 minutes, you overcome it. If you don't overcome or hold on to Jesus, you will not. You will sin. You'll lust. Okay? That's for men, and, and, and I don't know what the stats is for women, but in the, in, in the, um, uh, uh, um, the stats, it was for men. But what this says to me is, 20 minutes is really not a long time. And yet, how many men will succumb to that kind of temptation? How many Christian men will succumb? I mean, there it is. How did that website get on my screen? 20 minutes, the clock starts ticking. In 20 minutes, you have a choice to exit, turn off, walk away. But during that 20 minutes, the devil is burning in, come on. Come on, let's do something bad. Look at more. Look at more. Do something worse. I'm not going to get from Chester. But that's what the devil's doing. All you have to do is hang on for 20 minutes.
20 minutes. Jesus was tempted for 40 days. I mean, the devil really cranked it up. Not your typical 20 minute temptation. We're talking 40 days over a month continuously. That's the kind of temptation he went through. That's why the Bible tells us we have a great high priest up in heaven. He knows what you've gone through and more. Because we don't go through 40 days of temptation. We go through 20 minutes. That's why we can come to him and he can rescue us. Hallelujah. You see, he's the solid rock. He's the, our deliverer. Wow. Jesus, how did you do it? How did you last for 40 days, Jesus? Well, he got tempted. Three ways. Three kinds of, 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 of every every temptation that every throat get categorized into three areas. Pride of life, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh. Tells us in First John. But every time that the devil came, what did he do? He quoted the word of God. This is still good today. It's not just good back in 1611 when the King James was written. It's not just good during the, the Renaissance period, you know, or, or, or during the Great Awakening. It's still good today. I know a lot of people don't care anymore, and hopefully, if you don't, it's on this thing here, okay? But at least you got it. Because this is your way to fight the enemy. See? Jesus was relentless at using the word of God against the devil. In 2016, as your pastor, I strongly encourage you to be relentless about the word of God. Don't please a newspaper ahead of the word. Don't read the internet more than the word. This year, Satan will tempt you. You need to be relentless with knowing his word. The word is your defense against Satan's tempting. See, if you look at your bulletins, everybody should have in their bulletins another hand up here. Where's my card? Here it is. This is our relentless Bible reading plan. Just for the first six months, you can't put everything in one card. Okay? You'll get another one at the end of June. Okay? We would love for everybody in this church, this is a goal for church, to read the entire Bible in one year. And it's not even that hard. Please turn that off. It's not even that hard if you look at this. Okay, look, the first day, January 1st, is three chapters. Next one, three chapters. Next one, three chapters. Can, can we read three chapters? You know, three chapters? One, one of my pastor, mentor, mentor, mentor pastors, he said that it only takes the average person 15 minutes to read three chapters. Okay? That's slow readers, 15 minutes, okay? But it depends how much you want to get into and all that. 15 minutes. 15 minutes a day, if you do that for 365 days, guess what? You read the whole Bible. And wow, you get so armed against the devil. Because for sure, he's going to tempt you. For sure, within 24 hours, he will tempt you. Are you armed with the word of God? 15 minutes. Can you not give Jesus 15 minutes? Because this is Wow, this is the way we're going to defeat the enemies. This is the way we're going to be relentless by getting into work. In fact, when you go through that 20 minute period, you know what you can do? 15 minutes, read those three verses. Now you got another five minutes, you pray. You pray over the verse you just read. And Lord, you know, I just read this, and there was power in your word and all that. Don't be able to come after 20 minutes. Man, continue your life. But the problem is that. Why it seems like it lasts more than 20 minutes? Because you start dwelling. You're thinking about it. You start visualizing all those thoughts, and the devil is feeding it to you. You see, we can overcome. Maybe you never heard preaching like this before. I did my research in order to get ready for this mission sermon. I want you to know that we can all overcome. Amen. When the devil tempts, because he tempted Jesus, he did fall, and he's on our side. And he's not asking us to go through 40 days of temptation. He's asking us to go through a mere 20 minutes. And if you can't do the word, in fact, some of you don't even stop at three chapters. Read the whole, read the whole book. Don't take more than 20 minutes. And by the time you finish reading, guarantee that temptation is gone. Because the devil just gave up. See, until an opportune time, he says. See? See, see what happened here? Jesus go to the word of God and the devil just continued to war and took off until an opportune time. Yeah, can't take it. 
because too much of the word. Wouldn't it be great when the devil comes around tempting you and there's too much of the word in you? Hallelujah. Julio, you need to do a verse memorization workshop for the church. I still remember, not too long ago, that guy was memorizing what verse? A, was it a week or a day? What? A week. A week. That's 52 verses. That's good stuff. Can you imagine you get all that in you? Hallelujah. Three. See, when the devil comes around, we can fight. We can be relentless. We can use the word against him. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Let's not let the devil tempt us to sin anymore. Let's make this year a different year. Let's sin less this year. Are you with me? Let's sin less. Oh, why am I saying don't sin? Because okay, I'm, I'm not stupid here. The Bible even says those that say that they won't sin, you know, they obviously, you know, are, are arrogant and willful at times. I say, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to lie once in a while. I live here accidentally. But the main thing, am I going to get up? Am I going to say, God, forgive me? I repent and move on. See, that's the thing. But let it be go this year. We will sin less because we're into the word more. Amen? Hallelujah. And then, also, we are to be relentless in your tripping. In your tripping. Huh? What is that? Hebrews 3.12, the Message Bible reads, So watch your step, friends. Make sure there's no evil unbelief lying around that will trip you up and throw you off course, diverting you from the living God. See, to summarize what we talked about already, there's God's testing, there's Satan's tempting, and now there's your own tripping. <laughs> there will be times when you fall. Do you give up then? Oh, you know, I blew it. Oh, man, I, I must just give up this Christian life and all that. I must just stop going to church. I must stop reading the Bible. That's, that's how some of us do it. But that's not what this theme is telling us to do. We're going to be relentless, even when we fall. Luke 7, starting with verse 36, reads, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with, a, with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owe money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whosoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to see among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Yeah. What's going on here? This woman knew that she was a sinner. The Pharisee was disillusioned and thought he was not much of a sinner. You know what the worst thing is? When you think that everything is okay with you. When everybody else knows that you're not okay. When you think that, man, I'm kind of Mr. Perfect. I'm kind of Mrs. Like, like, like pretty pure and holy and all that stuff. And everybody else sees Kitty, look, look at what comes out of your mouth. Look at the way you act. Look, look at your attitude. Look at that temper. Whoa. You know? And go, I'm not getting mad. Just be firm. You know, whatever. That's what the Pharisee was like. You know? He, he thought he was justified. He thought he was righteous. The woman knew that she was a sinner. The woman was relentless in her tripping. See? Let me, let me tell you something theological right now. Thank God Jesus never tripped. He never sinned. He's been tempted. There's been, you know, sin creeping at his door, but he never tripped. Jesus' example of never tripping is the reason he's our rock when we trip. See, it's like when I used to be, uh, maybe some of you guys don't know this, I used to have a gambling problem, okay, when I was a teenager, okay, because I was pretty good at it. That's all I was a mathematician, got a math degree, and, uh, uh, you know, 
I was going to play blackjack. I'm going to work out all the probability. And I did. You know, read all the books and did you know, the calculations. So when I play, you know, I'm going to just play and lose money. You know, to me, that's stupid. Okay? So if I'm going to gamble, I'm going to gamble with the most probability. So I worked it out, you know, and there's a 10 and the 6 that that guy has, the dealer, and I have like a, you know, a 4 or whatever, it hit me or whatever, you know, all that stuff. Okay, I worked all the probability and I counted cards too because I had to freaking memory back. Okay? Even the 6 decks of card, I counted all the all the fifth card, all that stuff. Okay? And so, you know, I didn't lose a whole lot. I but I lost a little bit a lot. You know, I was into that kind of stuff. Okay? But what if, I remember I became a Christian and uh, like a real Christian. I mean, you know, there were times when I wasn't a real Christian, but I became a real Christian. And, and somebody told me I need to fix this problem. In fact, it was my my pastor who used to, who was a second pastor in this church, Pastor Howard Hawk. Okay? That's now we're gonna try to get his wife out for our, our 60th anniversary. But he passed away. He prayed for Vicky and me a week before we moved to Hawaii and prayed for his spirit to be upon us. And then he passed away shortly after that. Well, I don't know if you guys know, but he had a gambling problem. Okay? He was a big time gambler. And uh, you like to get so your friends that way, okay? But, but when, when I had to get rid of this gambling problem, I remember he said to me, okay, don't go to a gambler for help. <laughs> because then a gambler will join you, and then you guys all go to a gamble more, okay? Don't go to a gambler for help. And so instead, I went to a person who was tempted to gamble, but never did. Tempted to gamble, but he didn't trip up. You see? He knows how to resist the temptation. So that way I can learn how to overcome the temptation. And that's the theology of Jesus Christ. He's never tripped before. But 40 days of temptation. And every category imaginable to us. He went through 40 days of that. See, the scripture only told us three of them. But if he was tempted for 40 days, there were a whole bunch of temptations. That were not are, are not listed in the Bible. He went through them and he overcame. Hallelujah. And that's why I, I thank God for counselors. And I, I really thank God for my wife. Makes my job passing easier now. So counselor just pass them over to her. Okay. I thank God for counselor. But she has seen too. I've seen it. It gets me. I've seen it. Yeah. I love her. But Jesus has never sinned. The Holy Spirit, capital C counselor, the Bible gives it. He's never sinned. You see, the devil hasn't tempted the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. But has not sinned. See, you would not go to a gambler if you have a gambling problem. But you go to somebody who's been tempted to overcame it. Jesus has been tempted 40 days worth. And that's just that story. There's other times. Opportune time. There are other times. The Garden of Gethsemane. Another. I mean, there's so many times, the cru crucifixion, the trial, all of them, and yet he overcame. Tempted to sin, but he didn't. That's why we can go to him, hallelujah. That's why he is the solid rock. Matthew 7, 24 to 27 reads, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Everybody say rock. rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Let's not stand on sand. Sand will sink. Rock is solid. And Jesus, it says, is the rock. And how do I know that? In, in Psalm 62, Psalm 62, verse 6. In the modern English version, it says, He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my refuge. I will not be moved. Turn to your neighbor and say, I will not be moved. <laughs> See, when you're on rock, if you are standing on solid rock, you will not be moved. In 2016, Calvary will stand on solid rock and not sinking sand. And each of us will be able to say, I will not be moved. In Matthew 16, 18, the English Standard Version says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, everybody say rock again. Rock, and that's Jesus' rock. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. How many of you would I have keep the hell not prevailing against you? Amen, amen. Yeah. But we have to be on the rock, okay? That's what happens in reactive situations. I'm going to go quickly through the proactive scenarios, okay? We have to be relentless in three proactive scenarios. 
be relentless in chasing God. Chasing God. Don't wait for God to chase you. It's not like a guy chasing a girl. You know that? You know, in 2015, there were two engagements here. Imagine if Deandra said to Zach, I don't like guys from Arizona. <laughs> what a rejection that would be. I hate rejection. Not guys. I hate it, right? That's why you want to ask girl, okay? Or what if Ruby says to David, I don't think accountants. You know, what if she was to say that? Major rejection. He might even change his vocation over it. Well, hallelujah. That was not the case, but see, that's a, that, that's what's scary about, about going after somebody. But let me tell you, you will not get rejected when you chase God. Therefore, be relentless. Don't stop chasing God. Be relentless. Be hungry for more of God. Be relentless. Love God more than the day before. In 2016, let's be relentless. And what does it mean to chase God? Let's get into, a, into his presence more and more. I'm talking about attending corporate prayer meeting every week. Set that as a goal. I think it's a good goal to spend time. I mean, you're going to get his word. You spend time in prayer. Let me tell you, those 20 minute temptations will shrink down to 15, 10, 5, 1. When you're in the presence of God, the temptation doesn't even last by the moment because your mind is so filled with the presence of God. Does that make sense to you? Amen. Amen. I want to challenge this church. Get into prayer this year. Be relentless in chasing God. Be relentless in conquering Satan. Don't wait for Satan to attack and tempt you. Take the upper hand and take the authority. In 2015, many of you experienced breakthroughs because of being extraordinary. Sue's parents, hallelujah. Can't say, I, I still rejoice with her over that. Many members here, your father, your parents, came to the healing service that, that was held in the Chinese congregation back in December. Hallelujah. The friend made the picnic that Pastor Aaron has been organizing every two months. 80 up to 80 people coming up to them. Hallelujah. Those are breakthroughs because for some, some of the people who have invited them, it's been hard to get them up to a church event. But there was a breakthrough this year. I'm going to say something prophetically right now. If you remain relentless in conquering Satan in 2016, I believe more parents, siblings, grandparents are going to get saved. I believe that. Do I hear an amen for that? Yeah. Am I the only believing this? Yeah. Look at the momentum. Two years ago, Vicky's parents got saved. One year ago, my parents got saved. This, 2015, the Chung's parents got saved. Or, or no, not Chung, the, the, well, whatever your name. Sue's parents got saved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There's a momentum building. It's like, I remember when, when Vicky gave birth to Ryan, there was a lot of barrenness in this church. After she gave birth, the barrenness broke, and so many babies in the church. You parents, thank Jesus, friends. thank her for, for convincing me to have another baby. I think. Mean, see, see what God is doing with it. There's a spirit that's in, the, in here, and, and he's into the saving momentum right now. Jesus is interested in saving people, but are we going to be conquering Satan in this? Are we going to take the authority over him? Don't stop praying for your loved one's salvation. Expect a loved one to get saved this year. Say to Satan, I will not be moved. Because mom, dad, brother, sister, they're going to get saved this year. You know, some of you have Chinese parents. And you're going, well, you know, they're not going to get much out of our English service. That's okay. You know, Pastor Eric, last year I installed him, one year ago, as interim Chinese pastor. I just had his review. Oh, man, he passed the test. I mean, this congregation is growing. They are on fire. And, 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 and with the board's approval, he's no longer the interim Chinese pastor. He is the Chinese pastor now. Permanently. Permanently. He's running a good service over there. If you got parents, if you got cousins, if you got grandparents and all that, don't speak Chinese, bring them up to the Chinese service. There's a reason why we're, we have a Chinese congregation here. It's not just for the others to, to go to. No, you got them there. You know, I mean, man, Chinese, so many of us around the world, right? I mean, if even there's some Chinese blood, they can understand a little bit of Mandarin or, or Cantonese, they can go to that service. Let's be relentless and let's conquer Satan this year. And lastly, let's be relentless in controlling yourself. Controlling yourself. Don't wait for the addiction to manifest. If you have a bad habit, an addiction, an obsession with something, whatever, TV, whatever, watching too much YouTube or whatever, be relentless in controlling it first thing in the morning. Give it to Jesus first thing in the morning. Don't wait for it to come and catch you when you're when you least expect it. Because then you might fall. You take a 
authority over, when you wake up in the morning, I take authority over this, this addiction, over this obsession. I'm going to control myself. Self-control from the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. We'll conquer it first thing in the morning. Want to learn how to be relentless? During the next two weeks, there will be self signups. We have a new self series called Relentless from John Revere. You're going to learn how to be relentless. Yeah. If you're a leader or a leader to be, this Saturday, summit meeting, you can learn from Dr. Danny Amashiro. If you're chasing God and you have to prove it to me, yeah. you'll receive an invitation to our annual re-encounter retreat. Yeah. I just booked Pastor Tex Te Texera in April to speak here. Yeah. He's got a powerful message that we've been talking about, and, and he, he's going to teach you how to be relentless. Prophet John Harkey coming back in May. We're going to have a relentless year. We're going to be a relentless church, and we're going to be relentless Christians. See, be relentless means not quitting. In 2016, don't be a quitter. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't be a quitter. Don't be, a quitter. be relentless means not being double-minded. In 2016, let's not be double-minded. Be relentless means not moving back and forth. Today, declare, I am relentless. I will not be moved. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. What a theme, God. Lord, it's a theme of victory. Lord, we're so tired of losing. We're so tired of falling down. We're so, so, so tired of blowing it. And yeah, sometimes it's because you're testing us and we didn't prove you. Instead of doing what you wanted us to do, we disobeyed. We're, we, we don't do that anymore. Or perhaps the Satan tempting us. We're tired of being tempted. We want to overcome. We want to conquer Satan. But Lord, we're tripping over our own sin, our own lust, our own flesh. But Lord, we want to be relentless in controlling ourselves. Lord, we want to stand on the rock, yes. not on the sand. The sand sinks. The rock is solid. And for this year, 2016, God, we want to be relentless because we're going to stand on the rock so that we can say to the devil, I will not be moved in Jesus' name. Amen. You listen to the song right now.